Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 19. You need to pray for me. Because I got a lot of verses and I just want to use. I mean it. I laid this out. God just kind of gave me, the Bible says preach the word. And so sometimes God will just give me words. And I'll just look at them in the Bible. And boy, that's good, that's good. And I'll put them down. And then I get so many of them, I don't know where to go. So this morning, I don't know where to go. You pray for me. Revelation 19, starting verse 11. <clears throat> We've been preaching out of Revelation 19 for a while. And I think that we're going to use that and segue into something else that preached for a while. Revelation 19, verse 11. You believe the Bible this morning, say amen. amen. I saw heaven open. <clears throat> Excuse me. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Pharaoh, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. I want you to uh, underline that thing of crowns this morning. We're going to talk about the kingdom. It's called in the Bible the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, Christ's kingdom. Some call it the millennial reign, but he has on his head many crowns. And we see why, down in verse 16, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of You need to understand that God is going to have his way no matter what. You can either fight with him, fight for him, or you can fight against him. And you're going to lose. You're going to lose every time you fight against the Lord. He has many crowns on his head. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Just think about that. That's what's in charge. That's what rules. That's the Constitution. Of, of his kingdom is his word. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should st the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. But you think about back in old days, on the, on the battlefield or in, in naval ships, if two... Uh, if two ships went to war with each other, when one saw that his ship was defeated and he was still afloat, the sign that he would surrender to the other captain was he would hand over his sword. He would hand over his sword to the, to the other captain's ship and that was signifying... I'm the captain, I'm in authority, here's my sword, we're done fighting. You, we lost. In the army, in the battlefield, when armies would meet together, the captain of one army that was being defeated, if he was remained, he would hand over his sword to the defeating opposing captain or general or whoever was in charge of the other army, but it was all done signifying by surrendering their sword. That means that they have been defeated. They, they, the sword represents their authority, their ability to fight. When they surrender, they're surrendering to that captain and saying, we are now submissive to you. We, we want to remain alive, but we realize that we are defeated. Here's our sword. We are surrendering. When you came to Jesus, lost, unclean, you were fighting the Lord, and it, you surrendered. You handed over whatever it was you were using to fight the battle. You surrendered that to the Lord and say, Here's my sword, I'm done, I'm defeated, I can't fight against you. I now am under your authority. Whatever you choose to do with me is your, uh, your way, but I'm surrendered in order to save my life. Okay? You realize you, you're fighting and you're not going to win. 
So out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, seven words, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Revelation chapter 11, turn there. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> at, at, what's interesting to me is at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it is declared that even though the battle hasn't taken place, it's declared that Jesus is already the victor. He won. He's won the battle before the battle's ever been fought. He's already declared the victor. Verse, uh, Revelation 11, verse 15, The seventh angel sounded, and there was in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. I love that. I love that. That is from Handel's Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus. It's where, if you ever want a mixture of of Bible verses with music, Handel's Messiah did it better than anybody in the world. I love it. Now, that may not be your style of music. It may not have enough hillbilly twang in it. It's got, it's got King James Bible verses all in it. And that part of where it says, King of kings forever and ever and Lord of lords. It's, he combined Revelation 19 with Revelation 11. He combined passages out of that and put that in the hallelujah chorus and it, i don't know if you know this or not but it is tradition king george the first time he heard this he was listening to the handles messiah and when they started playing the hallelujah chorus he stood and of course when the king stood everybody else stood and finally at the end they said why did you stand on this particular one he said i've never heard such majestic music in my life and he said, I felt even as a king that I must stand in regard to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so it is tradition now, amen, it is tradition when Handel's Messiah is played, when they get to the hallelujah chorus, everybody stands. And it's that idea that he is king of kings and Lord of lords. And the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ are become, well, the kingdoms of this world and are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God, O art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Somebody say amen. I want to ask the question this morning, is Jesus reigning? Is Jesus reigning? Is He reigning Number one, in your life, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven prophesied in the scripture, yet the Bible says it is already now the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They are already ruling and reigning. Is Christ in your life? Is Christ, is the kingdom of heaven manifested in your home? In your home. Husbands, you're the leading authority in the home. Have you surrendered to the king of kings? and Have you given over your sword? Because if you're still trying to reign and have not submitted to Christ, you are at war with Christ. And I promise you, and some other men in this church will signify that by shouting amen that wins the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you lose. You're going to lose. Whatever, and you may not like what he takes in the spoils, but he can take whatever he wants. Amen? Thou hast taken great power and hast reigned. He's already reigning. Is he reigning in your home? Is he reigning in our church? Is Christ the King of Kings here? Okay? We need Christ reigning in our country. We need Him to reign. Let's go to the prayer and you pray for me because within seconds I'm going to have to decide what I'm preaching. 
Heavenly Father, come before you today, Lord. I have no idea, Lord, what you have prepared for these people. Lord, I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to ask you, Lord, to guide me. Like you guided Israel of old, as you guided your apostles, as you guided your prophets. Lord, I surrender this pulpit willingly to the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is your pulpit. It is your authority. You're the one who reigns over these. I am nobody except an ambassador of the King of kings today. And I must only speak what he speaks. I must only give what he sends me to give. So Jesus, I'm asking you to come into this place and take it and rule out of this church. Rule in the hearts and the lives of these people. And teach us, Lord, the manner of your kingdom. Show us, Lord, your ways. Help us to follow in them all the days of our life, Lord. We have already been defeated. Serve willingly under your command. And we give honor and praise to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who wears many crowns. And Father, whatever crown that we might have in this world, we willingly cast those crowns at your feet. And you, you are the true and rightful King of our lives. So Father, teach us the manner of your kingdom. As you told the apostles, as you taught the prophets, Lord, would you speak to us today here at Bethel Church, Preach to us today, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel uh, was hearing from the elders of Israel. Samuel had troubles in his own house. His two sons, like Eli's two sons, were not following God. They were not serving God. And the people of Israel, after so many years of this, tired of it, and they said, we're, we're tired of the corruption now listen to me, we're tired of the corruption from the religious figures. We're tired of that. We're tired of being ruled, we're tired of being told that we have to give and we have to give and give. And we're giving to priests, we're tired of that. So give us a king. And it made Samuel mad, hurt his feelings, and he went to God angry at his own people. And he said, God, do you hear what they're saying? And God said, I'm going to give them what they want. Now, Samuel, you tell them that I'm going to give them what they're for, and they're not going to like it, but I'm going to give it to them anyway, but I'm going to give them a king. And so God relented or gave in to the people's desires and gave them a king. So in 1 Samuel 10, 25, then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom. And if you want to read that later on, you can find that Samuel 10. And wrote it in a book. The manner of the, here's, here's my point this morning. The manner of the kingdom is written in a book. And that you're holding that book in your hands right now. Happy birthday, Hunter. You're holding that book in your hands right now. You want to know the manner of, of the kingdom, it's right there. If you want what God requires of your life, you're holding it in your hand. If you want to know what God requires of your marriage, you're holding it in your hand. If you want to know what God requires of you raising your children, you're holding it in your hand. The manner of the kingdom is right there in that Bible. Now in, um, boy, where do I want to go? Deuteronomy 7, turn there very quickly. Deuteronomy 17, that's not, that's, I'm just the introduction here to where I'm really going. There's a lot, a lot to be written, a lot to be preached on as far as the manner of the kingdom, God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they are identical. What the Bible says about one, the Bible says about but he said in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God had already known that at some point when they got into the land that they were going to be asking of a king. And here's what God said. Now, I want you to think about this. Whatever area of life that you're in, if somebody is underneath your authority, whether it's to their families, mamas to their children, pastor to his congregation, a president to his people, or a king, or a monarch, or whoever it is, this applies. This applies. Wherever, if you are a manager, where you work, this applies. Whoever 
is in authority in any place. This applies right here. You want God's way. You want the manner of the kingdom in your life. If you are in authority, this is, this is how it's got to be. He said in verse 14, When thou land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, my brother. Now, I want to apply that to our country. We should not ever bow nor cave in to the demands of the United Nations or any other organization that wants to establish their authority over the people of America. We are a nation. We're not gonna, we are not to elect a stranger, someone who is not of our people, to be a king or a ruler over us. If they're not an American, they shouldn't, they, they shouldn't rule over us. If they are not responsible in answer to our, to our courts, to our judges, to our constitution, if they will not answer that, then they have no right ruling over us. If we're going to have somebody rule over us, they've got to be of our own kind, our own people. Can I hear you say amen? Now, I know America has a mixed bag in it, and I get that, and I understand that, but at least we're all here together under the same constitution. That's the law. Amen? Same way here in this church. We're not, we should not have a Buddhist come in here and stand behind this pulpit and try to give you Buddhist theology and say, now isn't that sort of like how you believe? We ought not have anything like that here. But if, if they're going to be in church and preach out of this pulpit, even though we're a mixed bag, a riffraff, as it were, a, a collective... We all agree that the Bible is the word of God. It is the final authority in every issue of life. And, that is, and that's who we are subject to. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Said, um, verse 16, He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither, and that's what Solomon did. Most of the kings of Israel did exactly that. They multiplied wives to themselves. And God said, don't do that. Because it turned their heart away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Verse 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the night. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. I've, I'm one of these, if they're going to swear on the Bible... They ought to have to read the Bible and rule by it. And he said, he shall read there in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law to do them. Verse 20. Watch this now. You're in authority. You are in authority. Guys, hang your machoism outside and leave it there. It's got no place in your home. You listen, the reason why the king was supposed to write a copy of the book and read it. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. You're the husband, I get it. But you better not ever lift above your wife and your children. And think that they are in it to serve God you in God's eyes a king is a servant to his people not the other way around you don't believe that Jesus washed his disciples feet he did not demand that they bow before him and wash his feet he got down and he washed his disciples feet he was a king. Watching over, meeting the needs of his disciples, meeting the needs of his people when people would come to hear him preach. And he realized just how hungry they were. He would stop preaching and ask, is there food that we can gather to eat? They've come a long way. 
and I fear that if I keep preaching, they'll, they'll faint because of starvation. I'm going to meet their needs. You follow Jesus. It's His kingdom. You are to follow His guidance, His footsteps, and be, as the husband, you are a servant leader. As pastor, after church today, I am yielding myself to the needs of this church and what I'm going to ask you. That's where my heart is. Just to give you a little glimpse, I'm being asked by several churches to come this year. And, it, and it's filling up, filling the schedule up very quickly. And rather than me accepting all these as yet... I'm coming before the church to ask you for your permission. My first responsibility is to the needs of the people in this room. That's where my heart is. You're not here to serve me. I'm here to serve you. And that's how I see it. So you pray about it, all right? But he said that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand nor to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. You remember what the old men, who was at Rehoboam? The elders of Israel, the son of Solomon, they went to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and they said, your father, I mean, he did great things, built the kingdom, built his palace, on and on and on, but his taxes were too high. We're asking you to lower the tax burden on us. And if you do, we'll serve you. When Rehoboam went to the elders of Israel, the elders, the, the aged men counseled him and said, if you'll lower the taxes, they'll serve you the rest of their life. You will be their favorite king in the whole world. So then he went to counselors, the guys who were spending the king's money. What should I do? And they said, stick it to them. You're the king. Take their taxes, double it. Rehoboam took the younger men's counsel and lost 80% of the kingdom. Ten tribes pulling away saying, we're not going to be under you. He lost it because he would not yield to the needs of of the people. There's great wisdom in that, guys. Anybody who has any realm of authority, there is great wisdom in that. Amen? Now, it's noon, and now here's the message. So turn to Matthew 13. And it's me. Because I'm just feeling my way through this thing. Matthew 13 is full of teaching parables concerning the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to preach this this morning. I don't know what extent I will, but I'm going to deal with one of these parables this morning. Just one of these parables. Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. And what he means by that, he's, he gave a parable to listening. And they went, okay. They didn't quite understand it. But when Jesus had his disciples next to him, and he said, I'm teaching in parables because for them, they're not going to understand it. But to you guys, I'm giving you, the, I'm giving you the mysteries. I'm giving you the understanding. I'm giving you the secret by this. And I'm teaching you how the kingdom is applied and, and, and how, how heaven works and how salvation works and how the gospel works. I'm teaching you these things. Now, in um, verse 3, show me what to say. Verse 3, he spake many things unto them in parables, parables saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, 
where they had not much earth, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some hundredfold, some sixty, some. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered, said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath, uh, shall have more abundance, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak unto them in, in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. That word wax gross means it's, their heart is become, it's enlarged, and it's become like heart, like stone. Pierce it, nothing can get through. Hold your place there in Matthew 13. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And what we've got is people with ears that do not hear. But they do not see. They have a heart, but they do not understand. And they are all about serving themselves, fulfilling their needs, their desires, their lusts, whatever it is they want, and what's happened, they do not, they are not yielding themselves to the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in their lives, reigning in their homes, reigning in their marriages, reigning in their churches, reigning in their, in their communities, or wherever it is, they're not yielding to God's kingdom and Christ's authority in their life. Nothing from the Bible pierces through to their heart. They have a stony, and I'm going to preach on this here in a minute. They have a stony heart of rejecting God's word. So he then gives them the understanding. Verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. This morning to bless your eyes that they can see and bless your ears that they, that they can hear. Or else everything I'm preaching you this morning is just, it's just going to skip right over your head like a stone skipping upon the water. It's not going to help you. It's not, you're not going to have any understanding of it. And you're certainly not going to yield to it. For he said, Fairly I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Hear therefore the parable of the sower. Now I've preached on this several times. And I'm going to preach it again. Probably the same way. Now I'm going to move through it fast, but I want you to listen to yourself. Where am I in these groupings? Out of these four groups of people, three of them, three of them burn in hell for eternity. Two out of those three didn't have to. The gospel laid in their lap. They had the preaching of God's word, but they would not yield to it. They did not want God being the King of kings and the Lord of lords in their life. And he's saying this is the manner of the kingdom. This is how the kingdom of heaven works. If you want Christ, there is one way. You must listen. You must yield. You must hear the word of God. So he said, when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. And catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed. Now I dare say that the gospel has been preached in many areas of this nation. A lot of people have heard John 3.16. They may have heard other verses out of the word of God. 
But their life being so full of devils, their life being so full of their own... When somebody has devils and they're lost, all they care about is their own selves. Whatever pleases them, you cannot tell them, hey, that, drinking that Budweiser, that's bad for you. Don't, don't drink that stuff. Don't drink that whiskey. I'll drink if I want to. They don't care what anybody says about them. They, people tell them, then them things will kill you. Ah, I don't believe, I heard a guy say, ah, I don't believe that stuff. I think they made that stuff up. <laughs> people try to give warnings. People don't hear. They don't heed the warnings. They don't listen. They want nothing to do with God's kingdom. You can preach all day, all day, preach the word to them. Give them Bible verses. Give them gospel CDs. Give them tracts. Give them DVDs that we have. They're not going to watch it. They want nothing to do with it. That group of people perishes, having heard the word, but not received the way, shape, or form. And Christ, listen, even if they do not yield to Christ in this life, when they stand before him in judgment, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And I'm telling you, Christ is going to have his way, do you yield or not? He's won the battle already. The battle of Armageddon has not happened yet, and Christ is gone. I've already won it. I'm already victorious over it. You cannot beat me. You cannot run from me. You cannot hide from me. And one of these days, you are going to bow. First group. Then we have the second group. Verse 20. This is church people. He that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, sounded good for a little while. Sounded good for a little while. I've been in church a long time. Raised my children in church. They've been in church all their lives. That's all they've known. They've seen it, and I've seen it. Will come. They come to the altar, cry out some sins, get back up, and for a while, things sound good. But then, something is said, something is preached, something the Word of God. And I've seen people literally get up out of the service and leave the church. Never to come back. Angry. Furious. At something that was said behind the pulpit. I've seen it. People do it and they do it in just about every church that there is. Because they like the part about having their sins forgiven. But there's other parts in the Bible that apply to the manner of how God is going to reign in their life, and that's not what they want. Certain issues that should be preached that they don't want to hear, and they're not going to listen to it, and they're not going to yield to it, no matter how often it's said, no matter what verse, they're not going to yield, and they're not going to give in. The root of the seed, I mean, it springs up, but see, that same seed is trying to reach down for depth. And it hits a stony area of their life. They refuse to believe. It's not that they didn't like the preacher. They may have used that for an excuse. But something from the Bible was said to them, and they didn't like it. And they rebelled, and they walked out. And because... There was no fruit manifest. The tree gets cut down, it withers, and is cast into the fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you hearing the word of the Lord this morning? I don't have an agenda in this message. I promise you, I don't. I don't have someone pegged that I think needs to hear this. I have no idea. Why God took it in this direction. But I'm here to tell you. Yield to the manner of the kingdom written in the book. 
or there will be no kingdom in your life. Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. That includes every area of your life, public and private. All of that belongs to God, or nothing with God. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. Who said that? Way to go, Jaden. Extra piece of candy for him. So... He receives, see it in the stony places, the same as he that hears it with joy receives it. Yet he, hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of what? The word. The word. The word was spoken, the word was preached. They didn't like the word. They didn't like the commandment. They didn't like... We're teaching in Sunday school about the New Testament as a contract. Have you ever signed a contract without reading it? Raise your hand. And then found out you, it's in the contract. You can't do it. And you can say, that ain't fair. All you want to, you signed the contract. Just because later you found out you didn't like it, that's too bad. You signed the contract. You agreed that, that this is how. Now, my suggestion to you is before you decide to follow Christ, learn a little bit about it before you jump into it. Because I've been in church a long time. You've been in church a long time. We've seen people jump into it and then decide they didn't like it. Boom, they're gone. And they're not that's the, they get offended. Then verse 22. This is church people. He also that receives seed among the thorns. Is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world. Means you're worldly. That means you like Lady Gaga. And Janet Jackson. And Tupac. And Willie Nelson. You like the things of this world. You like the music of this world. You like the shows of this world. You like the enticements of this world. You like the sleazy saying it right you like those things and let's get honest I'm not talking to a bunch of people out here riding up and down American Legion Drive I'm preaching to people sitting in here that you like worldly Matthew says the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches Mark in Mark chapter 4 adds Another thing to this, he says, the lust of other things. Does that pretty much cover it all? Those are your thorns. Your thorns will choke out the word. Your lusts. The deceit, cheating people financially, going after filthy lucre, looking at porn on the internet, chatting with women or men, going, at, going after stuff on Sunday when, I don't know, it seems to me that we should be here on Sunday. Am I right in saying that? But your cares Sunday except come to church. And I know I know people miss every now and then. I get that. My goodness, I'm allowed a vacation every now and then. But when it's repetitive in your life, 
and everything else comes up on Sunday. Sunday, go back to church. Well, we couldn't go to church. Well, that, we had to do this, had to do that on Sunday. And, and I, had, I had family called, and family said, we've got to have a meeting together. We've got a family reunion. Now, why is it the families always have a stupid family reunion on Sunday? We go to church, and believe it or not, they'll plan it on Sunday deliberately to see you come down and miss church. So I'm preaching old stuff that I heard preached. And I think it's still right. Those things will choke your life and you will not produce fruit and you'll burn. That's the kingdom. That's Christ reigning in your heart. There's one more. Verse 23. He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understand which also beareth fruit. And bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, you know what I like about this? Not everybody is told by God and commanded to produce the exact same amount of fruit. Always some that produce little and some that produce a lot. It's always going to be that way. It's not a contest, is it? It's not a contest, and it's not a... It's not a thing, or a jealousy thing, where somebody can do this and you can't do it. And Well, if I can't do that, then I'm not going to serve God. Bloom where God planted you. Bring forth fruit how God wants to bring forth fruit out of your life. It's that easy. But he finds that good ground. That good ground that's been plowed up. That fallow ground that's been plowed up. Looking up so the seed can go in. And the, the rubbish and the rotten things of their life falling to the ground is what produces the good, where the, it's the good ground where the seed can produce fruit. It's, listen, the worse you were, the better off you'll be. Somebody say amen. That's, that's the kingdom right there. Taking the very worst of us and making the saints of God out of it. But find out where the hard ground is and beat the sword into a plow and plow it up. Find out where the thorns are and take this, take this book and cut them things down. Get down, find out where them roots are and pull them up. Get them up out of there. It's my little flower bed. I mean, it's looking great. But them stinking, stupid wild onions are in there. And I got to get out there and pull them rascals up. And I'm not going to eat them. They're good for nothing, as far as I'm concerned. If you want them, I'll give you a whole sack of them. But as far as I'm concerned, they're good. But those things have, you've heard me preach this before, those things have got to get out of our life. Or it's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy your home. We've had marriages bust up out of this church. Homes destroyed in the years that I've been here. And I've seen it happen every time. The thorns just choke out. The stony ground just hardens and people don't, don't, they don't get any root in themselves. And you can tell that they care about everything else in the world except right here. We're going to have the kingdom of God in this church. God's kingdom of heaven in this place. We're going to have to let God do the ruling and the reigning. I hear you say amen.